In the previous modules, we discussed a number of static and dynamic measures that on average are significantly different in Chiari patients compared to healthy people. However, none of these on their own fully explain how symptomatic Chiari arises, why many people with herniations don't experience symptoms, or why most Chiari patients aren't diagnosed until their early 30s. In 2022, Conquer Chiari researchers published a new theory to address these questions that focused on something called compliance. Compliance is a technical term for how easily a material expands in response to pressure. In this case, the material is the dura covering the spinal cord in the cervical region, and the pressure comes from the spinal fluid underneath. Specifically, when the heart beats, blood is pumped into the brain, which forces a certain amount of spinal fluid out of the brain and into the spinal area. In a healthy person, the fluid flows freely across this junction and back, but in a person with Chiari, the herniated tonsils block some of this flow. However, the researchers also hypothesize that in a healthy person, the cervical dura is somewhat flexible or compliant and expands outwards in response to the inrush of spinal fluid. In contrast, in Chiari patients, they believe the cervical dura is stiffer or less compliant and does not expand as much during the cardiac cycle. The result of the stiffer dura is an increase in the pressure of the spinal fluid similar to how hardening of arteries is linked to high blood pressure. Therefore, in symptomatic Chiari, the combination of the tonsils blocking spinal fluid and the reduced cervical compliance at the same level due to a stiff dura creates a situation where there are abnormal pressure spikes of the spinal fluid during the cardiac cycle. These pressure spikes are made worse by activities that naturally increase pressure, such as coughing, sneezing, and physical exertion. Unfortunately, Researchers have not yet figured out how to directly measure compliance using MRIs, so this idea can't be directly tested. However, research from Europe that involved continuous pressure monitoring of Chiari patients showed that while the average spinal fluid pressure of Chiari patients was normal, there were high spikes of pressure during the cardiac cycle. If shown to be true, compliance explains why herniation alone in most cases does not lead to problems. In these cases, there is enough compliance in the dura to compensate for the blockage. It also explains why some people have small herniations and severe symptoms, because their compliance is low, and others have large herniations with minimal symptoms, because their compliance is high. The next logical question is why do symptomatic Chiari patients have stiffer, less compliant duras in this region? One possibility is that the cause is genetic and that Chiari patients are born that way, and over time this leads to problems. Supporting this idea is a genetic study, which found that nearly half of Chiari patients had an alteration to a collagen or connective tissue-related gene. However, another possibility involves a little-known connection between the suboccipital muscles of the neck and the cervical dura, known as the myodural bridge complex, or MDBC. The MDBC was first identified in 1995 and is a collection of fibrous links between the suboccipital muscles and the dura. Microscopic studies have shown that the MDBC doesn't simply connect to the outside of the dura, but rather it penetrates and merges with it. This has led some researchers to speculate that the function of the MDBC is to control the tension of the dura during head and neck movements and promote the flow of spinal fluid across this junction. While this has not been definitively established, animal studies do support the idea that the MDBC influences the flow of spinal fluid. So, if the MDBC is capable of passing tension from the suboccipital muscles to the cervical dura, then that means the compliance of the cervical dura in a healthy person is dynamic in nature and changes in response to activation of specific neck muscles. Based on this, the researchers speculate that in Chiari patients, the MDBC experiences mechanical failure and stops working properly. This then changes the properties of the cervical dura, causing it to become stiffer and less compliant. Preliminary studies of MDBC pieces removed during Chiari surgery show that the material composition is different than the MDBCs of healthy people. Of course, this leads to another question. Why would the MDBC fail in Chiari patients?
At this point, the theory becomes more speculative, but one possibility has to do with instability, specifically at the atlanto-occipital joint, which is where the skull rests on the spine. Different research studies have shown that Chiari patients have smaller stabilizing muscles and shorter stabilizing ligaments, both suggestive of instability in this region. It is possible that subclinical instability of the atlanto-occipital joint causes repeated activation and overwork of the suboccipital muscles as they try to compensate. Over time, this repeated overactivation leads to mechanical failure of the MDBC, which then causes the dura to become stiff and reduces cervical compliance. The reduced compliance, in combination with the herniated tonsils, then leads to abnormal pressure spikes, which are made worse by straining and physical activities. The final question, then, is how does this abnormal pressure environment lead to symptoms? Here is where we circle back to our earlier discussion, specifically the strain placed on the cerebellum and brainstem in Chiari patients. In this theory, the abnormal pressure environment caused by the combination of tonsillar blockage and reduced compliance leads to abnormal pulsations, which in turn cause microstructural damage to the cerebellum, brainstem, and the upper cervical spine. Damage in these regions of Chiari patients has been found using a special type of MRI. It is very important to keep in mind this is just a theory and parts, or even all of it, are very likely to be wrong. While it is based on existing evidence, many research studies will need to be undertaken to verify each part and the theory as a whole. It is also important to realize that the theory it is not all-encompassing. For example, how it applies to pediatric cases is not known. Even among adults, it is likely that Chiari comprises several subgroups of patients. This theory is most likely applicable to what is sometimes referred to as classic Chiari how it applies to patients who also have Ehlers-Danlos or pseudotumor cerebri, is not clear. A comprehensive theory of Chiari, even if parts of it are wrong, is an important step forward in our journey. Conquer Chiari has already launched a research project to test certain aspects of this theory, and in the future will commit whatever resources are necessary to develop it fully.